What a discussion, huh? Obviously very timely, very hilarious, all of it built into one. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our next guest, whose story is another one of representation that doesn't get enough attention, a story of disability within the queer community, and also a story of self-discovery. So everyone, please join me in welcoming to the stage speaker, coach, writer, and advocate, Carson Tuller. Hi. Oh, sorry. Blow everyone's ears out. I am so excited to be with you. And I want to start by just getting personal for a second, right off the bat. I thought I was going to come on this stage and do this perfectly. I was going to just wow all of you. But I'd rather just be with you. So, would you join me in just taking a deep breath, just one? So let's inhale and exhale. That was for me. <laughs> I want this time to be about you, and I want you to take a second to fill yourself in your seat because I want you to be in touch with yourself while I'm talking. I'm going to share a little bit about my story, but really what I'm talking about is freedom. So I want you to be in touch with who you are, who you want to be, and what's possible for your life. Deal? It was just two weeks after I broke my neck that I woke up in a hospital room with tubes coming out of every orifice and machines buzzing and beeping, all keeping me alive. I had just had two spinal fusions that saved my life, and the nurse in the room asked me if I wanted to get dressed for the day. It was my first day of physical therapy. So I said yes, because I was eager to get out of the little skimpy, revealing hospital gown I had been in for the last couple of weeks. And my family brought over some street clothes for me to get changed into. So my parents helped me pull this V-neck over my C-collar, making sure not to jostle my newly placed titanium, and they plopped me in a wheelchair for the first time. I rolled over to a floor-length mirror, and I looked at myself for the first time as a disabled person. I'll never forget this moment, because when I saw myself, my stomach dropped. I'd lost 35 pounds, I looked gaunt, I looked like I'd just barely survived something, because I had. But more than that, I felt broken. I had somehow depreciated as a human being. There were a lot of unknowns in this moment. I did not know yet whether or not I would recover, but I did know that my life depended on me getting better. I had to walk again. Spoiler alert, didn't happen. <laughs> but pretend you don't know that yet. So I launched myself into recovery, thinking that this was going to solve my brokenness. So I went to physical therapy five days a week, and I went for five hours a day. I dropped out of school. My parents took me in and took care of my activities of daily living. And week after week passed, and month after month passed, and nothing got better. The doctors at the end of that year all said the same thing. Your kind of injury is not the kind that gets better. There were really two injuries for me. There was the day that I broke my neck and became paralyzed. And there was the day that I learned that it was for forever. So I took my grief off of the shelf, the grief that I hoped I would never have to visit. And I actually sat with what it meant for me to be paralyzed for the rest of my life. It felt impossible. And I was sitting there again, this time with all of my brokenness, thinking I was destined to live a life of second best, 
It felt like I was destined not just to live out plan B or C, but something like plan Y. I thought my life was over. I started calling the day of my injury the day of my death. I grieved my physical body. I grieved the ability that I had to do everything that I loved. But more than that, I grieved myself. It makes me emotional only because I remember the Carson who is still finding himself. <laughs> I thought that I had lost myself. So, since I couldn't recover, I decided that I would do the next best thing. I decided to become a super disabled. You know the... <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> But you know the kind of disabled people I'm talking about. These are the people who go to the Paralympics, the people who do pull-ups in their wheelchairs. What's your excuse, right? I was going to be one of them. By the way, this is the only kind of disabled person that's actually acceptable to society, ableist society. So I decided I was going to the Paralympics, because why not? I had been a swimmer, I jumped back in the water, and I had 18 months to make it to Rio, Brazil. And I improved, and I competed, I did my very best. And in my mind, I was compensating for all of that brokenness that was still kind of lurking in the background. I thought, this will make me good enough. So I got as far as trials. I, got, I, I competed at trials to Rio, and I did not make the team. And that was okay, because I was so proud of my work, and I thought, that this would provide me with some peace of mind, that it would provide me with some sense of completion. But I got out of the water, I dried off, and there waiting for me was all of my brokenness again. I was angry, I was so tired of feeling broken, so I decided no more obsessing about recovery, no more obsessing about changing my body or overcoming it. I knew I needed to actually ask myself, what's my relationship with disability? What does it mean to have a human body? I brought some philosophy into it. I knew that this was the path to my freedom, but I didn't know exactly how to get there. I just knew I felt this pervasive brokenness. You're gonna hear me use that word like a thousand times. So as I sat with my brokenness, I noticed something very peculiar. I noticed that it was familiar to me. It was something that I had experienced my entire life. That's because I was a little queer kid. And I knew from the time that I have memory that I was different. I grew up in a loving and Mormon and traditional family, so I knew that being queer wasn't really allowed. So I hid it as best I could, honestly, not very well. And I felt just this darkness. I don't need to explain to the people in this room how it feels to deal with internalized queer phobia. So I felt this way until I came out. I came out one year before I broke my neck. It was 2013, it was a big year for me, as you can tell. And I had come back from a mission, and I came out, and for the first time, I decided that I was actually going to deal with the premises of being gay. So I asked myself the same philosophical questions. What does it mean to be gay or queer? Am I really evil for who I love? By the end of that year, I had discovered that queerness had never been my problem, but that my beliefs about it was the problem, my beliefs about being queer was my problem. This was a miracle to me. This was the first time in my life that I felt whole and complete. Like I really felt like myself. Again, I think a lot of queer people know what this phenomenon is like, to meet yourself again. So here I was, a couple years later, sitting in totally different circumstances, feeling this brokenness. But this time, I had queer wisdom on my side. I had some experience. 
and I dare to ask myself, could it be that freedom is possible here, here, too? The way it was with queerness, I had the audacity to ask, is it possible that disability is not my problem? It felt like an impossible question. It felt a little ridiculous because I'd broken my literal neck. <laughs> like, wasn't I broken? Didn't that mean something about me? I dealt with this question for several years until I had a conversation with my 13-year-old sister that really changed my life. She turned to me one day, very casually, and said, what if we called it the day of your rebirth instead of the day of your death? And I thought, oh, how cute. No. <laughs> right? It's the day I died. Uh, so I kissed her goodbye. I went to the gym that day, but I couldn't get her question out of my head. Was it the day of my birth, rebirth, or the day of my death? Over the course of three hours, I had a paradigm shift that really changed everything for me because I realized that I got to say, I got to rewrite what it meant to be disabled the same way I got to rewrite what it meant to be queer. So I was sitting in the gym in these little booty shorts and a skanky purple tank top. <laughs> and I looked over in the mirror and I saw all of me for the first time. Carson had never been gone, Carson had never died. I got my life back in that moment. It was like I had been looking for something so precious and I just found it in my back pocket. And as I looked at myself, still paralyzed, I didn't have a problem. Paralysis had never been my problem. Ableism was the same way queer phobia was my problem. You can see I'm drawing parallels hard parallels here. <laughs> so this changed everything for me. Like, I moved out. I went back to school. I took on my life, and this time for life's sake, not to overcome anything, not to turn myself into some object of inspiration for abled people. I just lived for me. I even started dating, which was a big hurdle for me, and I even had really really good sex. <laughs> Disabled people have great sex, I know. But this was all so important for me. And I was sitting there feeling like myself again, in the same way that when I came out, I found Carson. I had now experienced two transformations that felt exactly the same. And in both cases, I had found myself. They tasted the same, and I wondered, do these belong to the same phenomenon? Is it possible that these things are actually the same? So I was so interested to be able to return to myself and find out what was in the way. In both instances, there was something in the way of me finding me. I wanted to know what that was so I could replicate this, this Freedom was so delicious to me. So I went to Staples and I bought poster-sized sticky notes that I plastered all over my office walls. And in big, gay, dramatic writing, I wrote the story that is my life. And then I started to document really everything that had happened to me, the good, the bad, the triumphs, the victories, and also the failures and tragedies. And I was looking for clues. And I sat there, I rolled back, <clears throat> and I looked. And I looked until a concept emerged that clicked, that made sense to me. The thing that was in the way the whole time of my self-expression, of myself, was games. I had been unknowingly playing games that were robbing me of my selfhood. So, what do I mean by games? A game is a system in which players engage in an artificial conflict defined by rules that results in a quantifiable outcome. In other words, games are made up. We know this. They have rules, and there's a way to win. Think chess, Monopoly, soccer. All of these are examples of this. 
when we engage in a game, we understand that we're going into this fictional space where we adopt new premises and there are new rules. And we usually do so with consent and understanding. One of the ways that games are so, one of the reasons they're so exciting is because games really come alive when we play them. When the players walk past that chalk line on a soccer field, the same chalk line becomes like an electric fence when the game begins. We love games. Humans love games. But I noticed as I looked at the systems of oppression that had caused me so much suffering, in my case, ableism and homophobia and, and more, I noticed that these two were like games made up, arbitrary, totally artificial. They had rules and there was a way to win. But I saw that there were a couple of components that were very different that made these games dangerous and insidious. We never consented to playing these games. We were born into them. And these games were never called games. They were called life. When I came to Earth, they didn't say, Carson, welcome to Earth, where we use an unscientific and arbitrary gender binary to assign you a role that you'll be expected to fulfill for the rest of your life. No, they said, it's a boy, like it was just the truth. And this is how games work. We're assigned a game piece. And we're expected to go throughout life living out a role that was assigned to us, but that may not be a fit for our actual, beautiful, sacred self-expression. They tell us that playing the game will make us happy. They tell us that if we just stick to the game plan, if we just stay in line, that we'll find some peace. So we discard the self in order to be safe, in order to survive. And then we wonder, we thought life would be more beautiful than this. We're stressed, we're anxious, we feel like something's off because it is. We're living lives that we weren't meant to live. When I discovered this, I first felt so much relief. It all made sense. It made sense that I had had the feeling that I was looking for myself my entire life. Why I told my mission companion, I said, there's a Carson inside of me whose voice I can hear but I can never find. Games had obstructed my view of myself and that also made me angry. Angry because all of that was unnecessary. All of the suffering, all of those nights I cried myself to sleep, all of those years I thought I'd never be loved, telling my mom, no one's Prince Charming is in a wheelchair. The games convince us that the problem is in here, that there's something wrong with us. But those are just the messages of the game. I went throughout life with a new lens. I could see games everywhere. I could see big global games like white supremacy and patri uh, patriarchy, all of the games that we're familiar with. But then I also saw how they melted into other games and that were games at the cultural level, games at the family level, even games at the individual level, all threatening self-expression. I could also see though that games were necessary for humans. It's how we organize ourselves. It's how we make sense of life. So freedom is really not about living a gameless life. It's about knowing which games you're playing and then choosing to play them, leave them, or change them. We have never needed game changers more than we need now. We are seeing in real time the impact of games that have cost us our self-expression and our freedom and games that are killing our planet. In the last 50 years, two-thirds of vertebrates have died, two-thirds of songbirds, 50% of the trees have been cut down on the planet. People are fleeing their homes for refuge. We can see that these games are no longer working for us. And the IPCC has made it clear, 
the Intergovernmental Panel on climate, uh, climate Change, has made it clear that we still have time if we change the game. But only free people can free people. The world needs you to be free. Our planet needs you to be free. You and I are not here on the planet to just be pawns in someone else's game. We're here to discover who we are, what our purpose is, and we get to say it's all made up. My promise is that as you go looking for yourself, that there is a self waiting for you that is vibrant and alive and powerful, unleashed. So I humbly ask you, where is a game obstructing your view of you? Where are you still not free? Where do you think something might be wrong with you? I promise that the self, that self, will never tell you something's wrong with you. It's always a part of the game. Because you are, and always have been, whole and complete. So let's go create some new games. Thank you.